Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining the SESIMO webinar. My name is Damir Glass, and on behalf uh, of SESIMO, I would like to welcome you all today. Uh, during the webinar, we will discuss uh, latest technological and uh, application trends for IoT in manufacturing production. Uh, I think that uh, we can uh, already start. Uh, most of the people already joined. In the first part of the, of the webinar, we will give uh, an overview uh, on current use of IoT technologies in manufacturing processes, uh, the opportunities and the challenges they bring along. Uh, the second part uh, of the webinar will focus uh, on new upcoming technologies and uh, how companies uh, can, uh, can be prepared uh, to implement uh, them to accomplish uh, better performance, uh, high customer satisfaction and more rel uh, reliable products. Uh, so my guests today uh, are uh, Mr. Langefeld uh, and Mr. von Pomgarten, uh, co-authors of Roland's Berger's white paper on IoT uh, in production, challenges and opportunities for OEMs. Uh, so I would like to, to welcome them. Thank you both for for joining us today. Uh, so before we start, uh, let me give a uh, quick housekeeping rules to our online audience. So please keep your cameras off and microphones muted. Only presenters should uh, have their uh, cameras on. Uh, we believe that you will have uh, a lot of questions for our speakers. So for that purposes, uh, I would advise you to use chat feature. Uh, our team will monitor uh, chat feature uh, during, uh, during the webinar and uh, we will uh, read your questions during the Q&A session. Uh, so uh, please uh, be aware that uh, this meeting uh, is being recorded and will be posted uh, on our YouTube channel, channel later on. Uh, so that will be all from my side. Uh, I would like to give the floor now to Mr. Langefeld. Uh, so, Mr. Langerfeld, the floor is yours, uh, so please uh, share your presentation with uh, our audience now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, no, it works. Oh, sorry, then I was on the on the wrong button. Okay, so thanks again to Sesimo for hosting us today. We are pleased to give you an, a snapshot into our publication, IoT in Production. We see here the front page with one of the first pictures showing some of the use cases, but of course we will go further in depth now. If we just switch to the next slide, please. Yeah, so here you can see I'm on the left side, Bernhard Langefeld. I'm a partner at Roland Berger based in Frankfurt. I have a production technology background and work for more than 10 years in the industry as a factory planner. So always contact with, with production and factory planning issues. Um, now for 20 years in the consulting industry is always around production industry 4.0 and IoT. And we have Alexander with me. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Alexander von Pomgarten. I joined Roland Berger one year ago. Before I joined Roland Berger, I was working nine years for Siemens in various positions. I was, for example, working for the Mindsphere organization, which is an industrial IoT platform, and I was supporting their two big Siemens business entities, um, the process industry in the oil and gas and uh, gas and power division in the digital journey. And in that um, role, I was uh, I was involved in the development of around about 20 industrial IoT use cases. And then I joined the digital enterprise labs of the process industry, Siemens, where I was heading the partner management organization. And in that role, I was looking for complementary partners which could support our IoT business. And then um, I decided to to join Roland Berger because I was very interested uh, uh, in to see different companies as well as well as leveraging the knowledge I already gained. 
and then I did so also a certification in data science, so I'm, I'm able to support the development of an IoT use case end to end. Please, everyone, go on mute. I think there's still some background noise. Thank you. And uh, as I mentioned, since one year, I'm supporting various companies in their digital journey. Okay, then let's have a look on the next slide. Yeah, just a few words, you know, around Roland Berger. Maybe there are some some in the corner who don't know us. So Roland Berger is is a German strategy company founded in '67. So we are now more than 50 years in the business. Of course, you, let's say for German heritage, we have a very strong relationship to everything related to engineering in the wider sense, to production, to tool machines. That's, of course, why we are focusing today specifically on IoT in production, as this is one of our major themes. As you can see, we have more than 51 offices. We are truly global, and we are, of course, supporting across all industries with our topics ranging, of course, from automotive, aerospace, but as well to consumer goods. And in each of these, we are supporting Industry 4.0 slash IoT. Next slide, please. So here's a snapshot um, of our latest publication. It's called IoT in Production, Big Changes Ahead in Manufacturing. Please feel free to download it if you go on rolandberger.com and you just type it, type the title into the search field. You can you can free download this for free. It's a nice summary of everything that we are presenting today with all the deep dives into technology, challenges, approaches, et cetera, et cetera. And once you're there, of course, please look for the other material that we have as well. Of course, what we are going to talk today about, so of course, the use cases and the framework for production, then of course, how does the high level architecture has to look like if you want to introduce IoT in production? And of course, at the end, we all want to make money with this. So then, of course, we will look into the operationalization and commercialization of these use cases. And as you can see, in reality, there's a lot of hype about, in, about IoT, but the commercialization is quite difficult. So that's why, of course, many, let's say, projects are delayed or not really fully rolled out. But we will have more on this later on. And then the next slide after we deep dive in here. So, um, what we have, uh, what we show here is the, the current or the spend, the IoT spend in the year of uh, 2019 in US dollar billion. And uh, I think what's very interesting is that uh, most spend was done in the, mis in the discrete and in the process manufacturing industries. I think that's also the, the two main uh, um, industries our group is uh, looking for. And the, the, Two use cases which uh, were the most used are manufacturing, manufacturing operations and production asset management. Um, both manufacturing operations and production asset management are, so to say, categories. And behind those categories, you will find various different um, use cases. Um, some of Use cases are also shown on this nice picture, which is also part of our paper. As I was mentioning, these are big fields of use cases. And we, as Roland Berger, um, we also differentiate these use cases in Industry 4.0 and Internet of Things use cases, because many, many of those use cases, they are quite similar, and you could implement them as industry 4.0 use case or Internet of Things use case. And this is the reason why we also um, described or did a definition of both. So in general, you say an industry 4.0 use case is usually a use case which is implemented in the local enterprise network. And an IoT use case is a use case which uses the internet connection to send data. And this is exactly, in our opinion, also the differentiation between those. So is, if is the industrial network used solely or if the solution also uses internet connection to share information and data across the um, enterprise borders, so to say. Um, what we then also have done is we have 
developed a framework for industry 4.0 and IoT solutions. And Adam Bernhardt, would you take over now? Yeah, of course. So here you can see, based on the experiences of the project that we did, how you can basically split these use cases. And, and we found this as a most suitable split um, looking on the one side, of course, into advanced automation and robotics, what we, let's say, classically link to Industry 4.0. Then, of course, we need to look into logistics and material handling. Um, that's typically where you find the low-hanging uh, fruits in the use cases. Of course, you need to look into the augmented operator, so everything that is around the operator and helps him to work either more efficient, but maybe as well um, more safer. So these are use cases, of course, which are always interesting if you have as well to, to sell the project to the operators or to the workers' council, saying, of course, Industry 4.0 as well brings personal benefits to the workers in the plant. Then, of course, we need to think about connectivity and communications. This is, on the one side, it's a solution category, but on the other side, of course, it's as well a kind of enabler. Then, of course, we have in E the, the big block, big data and I, AI analytics, which, of course, at the end, then work with the data and create value out of the out of the data that you have gathered. And the last one, smart energy solutions, is a category. We worked a lot in the mining and the aluminum industry, so their smart energy solutions have been one of the big blocks. Of course, if you're just depending on public energy, you know, just get electricity, then this is not so relevant. Um, but of course, if you have high energy consumption or special use cases, and this can be as well relevant. So typically you work with A to E and in some cases as well with F. What we have now on the next slides are basically summaries of the different use cases. So what we've learned in all the projects we did across the industry. So for example, like in mining, like in automotive, like in mechanical production, like in healthcare, like in, in the food industry. Let's say there are 60, 70 percent of the use cases work all the time, and then there are, let's say, 30 percent of the use cases which are very, very, very specific to a certain certain industry. And so we have started to mapping these use cases along the different categories as described before, and we've put together here some examples. What are the typical use cases? And we will just flip you now through some of the examples so that you get an impression. So the first of course, is advanced automation robotics. I think that's a topic we typically automatically link to IoT and Industry 4.0 if we think just about more automation, more autonomous machines. So you can see on the left side uh, topics like smart factory concepts, connected machines, autonomous production, autonomous robots, autonomous vehicles, pick and place solutions where robots like human beings grab parts out of a box and put them into a machine. Mass customization, 3D printing was one of the big topics discussed in the context of, of 3D printing. Closed information, data life cycle. So that's things we see typically on the left side. And then, of course, if you look on the right side, we have things like overall equipment measurement, condition monitoring, real time control, production flow management, process control, et cetera, et cetera. And honestly, saying, of course, we have split them here in Internet of Things and industry 4.0 solutions. But at the end, we have learned, of course, you need to look holistically at, at the topics. And sometimes you do it via, let's say, an IoT solution, but sometimes you can do the same thing as well via a landline, and then it's an industry 4.0 solution. So at the end, it depends a little bit on the infrastructure that you have at each site. We have some more examples. If we flip on the next slide, this is an example. So for each of these categories, we have a, a framework, a case collection, where we have summarized all the cases that we came across. So this is a very special one here. This is a, a skimming and sampling robot in the aluminum industry. Um, of course, it's a robot, which in itself is not new, but this robot has an optical system and a camera, which can do an, an analysis of the quality of the aluminum. Um, so that is something that is definitely new. And of course, it combines the, the elements of, of visual inspection, the robot and the artificial intelligence to analyze these things. So many, many things are coming together. At the end, of course, it's, it's just a robot, but of course it has been upgraded and therefore adds additional value. Another example, I think, is on the next side. So this is an Internet of Things solution. So what we see in many, many cases, if companies have a either 
a distributed fragmented footprint or of course they have a, a production site with many many different machines of course oee so overall equipment efficiency is something which in certain cases is difficult to measure and of course is expensive to to roll out if you need to do it um, in an existing plant so there are of course solutions available where you basically just click a black box on each of the machines and then these black boxes send the signal to a, a computer basically which then of course puts all these data together and then of course you have the nice analytics graphs you can see utilization availability etc cetera, etc cetera, by just clicking one one simple box um, at each of the devices and this is a typical typical iot solution it's basically low cost with the device and of course you get a, a huge amount of data into one cloud or database system and then of course you start creating value on the data you've collected next slide then shows um, examples out of the um, out of the field augmented operator so how can operators work easier and better with these kind of solutions so mixed and augmented reality is one of the big topics it started with google glasses but honestly saying google glasses definitely failed then microsoft came out with the hololens which is a mixed reality um, device. It's, it's a very nice, very smart device. So you can basically view films on your, uh, on your HoloLens just by looking at a certain device. And then of course you can show a full movie how a battery needs to be changed and stuff like this. Currently the problem is that this device is quite heavy and quite expensive. I think it was around 5,000 euros. So it's not really ready for full industrial rollout. But of course, um, there will be other effects which positively will um, help growing these use cases. The US Army is currently working on a program to integrate basically a HoloLens into a helmet. Of course, it's the, the battle control system which is then on in, inside the helmet. But of course, once you have integrated into a helmet, it's a more lightweight construction, it's more robust, and of course, it's significantly cheaper. You can, of course, integrate this into the helmet of every worker. And then, of course, you can you can put basically everything in this system. So then, the helmet and the, the screen in front of the key are the key communication system. You can send him maintenance data. You can send him whatever a drawing. You can track where the operator is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we learned in some industries, again, mining industry, steel industry. Of course, safety is as well one of the devices. So we have seen examples um, where these devices send a signal which automatically stop trucks or forklift trucks when they come closer to an operator. They as well can track um, the pulse frequency of the, the operator, how, how hot is it in the aluminum industry, for example. So, of course, you can control as well the bio data of a worker and protect him from getting into any, any dangerous situation. Next slide, please. So, what we, now, what we will do now is we will... Um, we have now discussed and introduced you some typical industry 4.0 and IoT use cases. And now we will show you how you can put them in an overall architecture. Because really one of the key advantages of IoT is that you can break data silos. And what we have shown here on the slide is the typical product development approach from the product development over engineering, manufacturing, operations, and maintenance. And usually, to support those different steps, you have different IT systems like the CAD system, the PLM system, the EAP system, the manufacturing execution system, the manufacturing operations management system to support, to support that, that specific areas. And of course, in each and every step, there's valuable data you could use for, for the future. And um, usually when you are an OEM of a machinery, um, product, you usually develop your machinery asset and then you sell it to your customer. And that's usually then the last uh, point in time you get any information or data. Maybe sometimes you have agreed on a service contract and you get some data provided by a customer, but, but that's not uh, the normality. So yeah, really one 
key advantage of IoT is that you as an OEM, you have the possibility to get data and insights of your products, how your customer uses your products, and you can learn from this data. For example, if you have a condition monitoring or a predictive maintenance app, and you are you you're identifying that under specific circumstances, for example, a specific temperature and a specific duration, and um, an asset of you very often fails, you could use that information to improve the um, to pr improve the next product evolutions. And this is what we call the so-called closed lifecycle data loop. It's really a key advantage. And what, what's one of the key elements of that closed uh, lifecycle loop is the shared information model, because this shared information model will be really the single source of truth for you and for your customer to really leverage all advantages of IoT. So keep it in mind, with IoT, you have the possibility to, uh, to break data silos, to share information among various IT systems, to share information across company borders, and you can use that data to improve the next product evolution. It's, I think you should consider that, and it's, it's a very, very uh, big advantage of IoT. And now if you bring in a product context, um, you can also see how you can use IoT and cloud-based IoT solutions for manufacturing to share information across the entire supply chain. And what you can see in the central part of the slide is the, we call it the cloud-based IoT solution for manufacturing. And of course, behind there is an IoT platform or a native cloud. And there are various use cases which are, which are using the cloud infrastructure. And then you have the possibility to connect supplier data and you have the possibility to connect various factories and sites and i think what's also very important to understand so in the lower part lower left part of the slide you can find the classical five layer automation pyramid from field to sps to SCART, mes EA, the classical automation and here really iot helps to integrate IT and OT, so information technology and operations technology. Operations technology, the classical uh, automation pyramid. IT, the classical IT processes and uh, like ERP, supply chain and so on. And what's also very interesting uh, that there are numerous connection technologies to connect IoT devices. Um, some um, Technologies which we are also mentioning in our paper are 5G and LPVA, so low, low power wide area. Then, of course, you could use LTE, you can use GPS, Wi Fi, LAN, Bluetooth, RFID um, to connect um, various assets. And what's also very important, um, and that's the disruptive um, point of IoT. So, usually, when, you, when we talk about this, um, um, automation pyramid. Um, there are those classical automation providers like ABB, like Siemens, like Honeywell, like uh, GE, and so on. And usually they provide the customers uh, a portfolio across all layers. And so they also have this, this automation quite in their hands. But with IoT, you have the possibility to, dis to disrupt this classical automation layer because with an IoT asset and a IoT connectivity, connectivity asset, you are able to connect every asset um, of, a, of a production and you don't need to consider the specific layers. So you just want to connect an actuator from, the, from a specific uh, pump, you can do it. And you don't need to touch the, the SCADA system, for example, in that case. So that, that's a reason why there are also many startups are currently trying to to, um, yeah, to get in that IoT market because there are no technical hurdles anymore. So you, they, they have some, um, some industry expertise, some process expertise, and they have nice, um, uh, for example, predictive maintenance solution, which they, they developed an, on an IoT cloud. So they can easily access with that solution the customers and try to get um, or to, to generate business 
because they are not these technical uh, solutions anymore. And that's also the reason why the classical automation providers are currently trying also to get a foot into that market because it's of course a threat. And so there are currently, I would say, three main groups of three main groups which are currently active in the market. So these are the classical um, OEM and automation providers. There are startups and of course also the, the classical cloud providers and IT companies like Microsoft, Google, AWS, Amazon Web Service. They are also very interested in that market. What you will also find in that page here is that little box edge device or also to connect connect uh, um, IoT assets. You might heard about edge devices. An edge device has the advantage to, compi to combine the advantages of cloud, IoT, and on-premise solution. For example, there are some IoT cases um, in the predictive maintenance area um, where you are measuring um, high frequency vibrations. Really, you're measuring in, in a 20 uh, hertz area and uh, you, you need to measure very, very many data points in various milliseconds and um, of course, if you talk about IoT, you need an internet connection. And sometimes the internet connections is not fast enough to send data to a cloud, analyze it, and send the results back to, to the site. So this is the reason why many cases are also implemented on edge devices. There are some other advantages of edge devices. For example, um, you have the possibility to do a data pre-processing. Of course, it's uh, cost expensive to send every bit and byte into a cloud uh, infrastructure. So you have the possibility to do a pre-analysis and pre-processing of the data on your company um, on-premise, we call it on-premise, and you will also send the relevant data to the cloud. Then you have also the possibility to, to buffer information for example if the IoT connection or internet connection is broken and one also another big advantage of edge devices is that once edge device is implemented and installed in a production um, environment there's only less um, human um, effort necessary to to update the software on the edge devices and to upload new um, products and versions to it, to it because you can use the internet connection to deploy the software you want onto the edge device. And on the other hand, you can send the relevant data from the field uh, the, to the cloud. And then in the cloud, you have the possibility to train your data model again to improve your application. And once you have improved your application and you have developed a new version, then you can send the the application back to the edge device and then your customer or the the user can use that new software um, to to operate uh, his uh, manufacturing processes and an edge device so to say is quite comparable to a classical pcs or dcs system so industrial pc or distributed control system it's more has more or less the same functionality you have a smart device on that smart device is uh, some software running and this software has a purpose, for example, to, to control or to, to maintain the production processes. So this is also very interesting to understand because those edge devices, they are, um, a huge, they are in huge competition to the classical um, DCS, so this distributed control system and uh, industrial PCs. So this is also the reason there are um, various um, edge providers in the field. So in general, you can you can um, differentiate between two big groups, the classical industrial automation provider like ABB, Siemens, Schneider Electric, Honeywell, General Electric, Yokogawa. And it's also a very interesting market for the IT hardware supplier like Cisco, Dell, VMware, and HP. Also, days, uh, those companies, of course, they are trying to sell the edge devices to the market. And um, maybe also very interesting to understand you. So you just need a classical Ethernet connection to connect such an edge device into your production 
environment. So it's a very easy if to integrate those edge devices into, into the legacy systems. Um, what we also have done is we have structured a bit the entire IoT markets. So, and you can see that there are different layers. Um, it starts with the infrastructure providers. We are, I was already mentioning some of them, the Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google, SAP, IBM, Telecom, and those um, providers, they offer cloud infrastructure to their customers. And their main interest is to get as much as possible traffic onto their cloud because that's their main business. And those companies, they are mainly IT companies. So they understand IT processes and that's also currently their, their main, um, main market where they earn the most money. But of course, this entire OT area, so the production, um, for example, is a very interesting market for them because there are hundreds or thousands of assets in a production line, and each of this asset is, is producing a lot of money. And of course, for them, it's a big business to get that data um, onto the cloud. And this is the reason why those companies are also trying to get the experience and knowledge of a classical production environment. And because this layer is a classical IT layer, and it's very difficult sometimes for the classical machinery OEMs to understand that area, there are some additional um, players in the market, and we call it the IoT platform providers, like, for example, uh, Siemens Mindsphere, Adamos, Bosch IoT Suite, or Axum. And their idea is to provide the, their, them, their customer a solution which easily enables them to, um, yeah, to realize IoT and digital transformation. And of course, these platforms also um, bring the possibility to offer new business model and new service models. So there is a, an a additional layer on top. So it's also interesting to understand that this layer uses usually the infrastructure of those IoT providers. So for example, you can, you can Mindsphere is available um, as, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Alibaba. So you as an end customer, you have the possibility to decide which cloud solution um, you are looking for. Then, of course, there are various startups in the market and application pro providers, and those companies, they develop software solutions. And usually those software solutions, um, they are able to run um, on every kind of infrastructure, we call it cloud agnostic. It's just, let me just say one more thing about the second layer. So you, you can see that there are only five uh, items so far, but it's a, it's, a, it's a strong competition in that market. And you currently, there are more than 500 IoT platforms in that market. And it's so far not really clear who will win the, the race. So it's, it's still, a, Competition, and we expect some some consider uh, some consolidation of the market, but it takes some time. Okay, going back to the to the app and software developers, so there are numerous companies which are providing smart and intelligent software, which they try to sell uh, the, the the customers. Usually those uh, softwares, they are able to operate on every kind of infrastructure. Usually those companies, they use um, Docker strategies to um, enable their solution to run um, on different and various infrastructure. Their customers could also be the classical OEM and component and manufacturers, um, those uh, those companies, they are interested to enhance the product portfolio. So usually a classical uh, machinery OEM does not only offer the hardware anymore, they also offer application or software application and maybe combined with that application, a new service uh, model like uh, predictive maintenance. So they offer now a combination between hardware and software. And then of course, uh, there are the classical end customers, uh, like the automotive OEMs, and they are using the, for example, the machinery components which are were developed by the by layer four, 
and of course their main interest is to um, to improve their uh, production processes to make them as efficient as possible and to reduce uh, um, the stop or stop of production to a minimum so these are the different players um, you you can find in that iot market you see it's a it's a broad <laughs> range of players with uh, different interests and of course um this topic industry 4.0 and especially it is uh, is discussed since maybe three or three or four years but if we be honest it's still not um so implemented as we were expecting four years uh, before. So it, the, there are still some challenges in the adoption of IoT. We um, summarized some of those um, challenges here on that slide. So we have uh, two groups. We have organizational challenges. So these are classically the, the challenges a company is facing. So in the organization, in the processes, in the go-to-market. And there are also some techn te technological challenges. Um, I would like to start with the left side, so with the organizational um, challenges. So it's still that there is a lack of IT specialists. So the companies uh, currently don't have enough skilled people to drive that IoT journey. Then, of course, for the classical hardware and OEM companies, um, they are they are used to sell products, but very often they are not so ex experienced in selling software. And if you sell software, you usually also have to adjust your business processes, for example, the ERP process, because it's completely different to sell a product or to sell a software product which uses a subscription model where you have to, well, to track the consumption and where you have to, to bill and invoice um, your solution on a monthly or yearly basis. So there are different, these are completely different processes. Then also it's sometimes quite difficult to sell IoT solutions because um, usually the, the employees or the sales organization which sells products is used to sell a product catalog, but they are not uh, um, trained to sell entire solutions or um, tailored solutions. Of course, this causes employee um, concerns. Um, it's also difficult to develop the right business model so that there are different uh, different businesses in the market we will capture that in a few minutes um, another mistake that is very often done is that um, the companies uh, see or hear from the IoT hype and of course they want to participate also in this IoT market because the competition does as well so the usual uh, approach to develop an IoT solution of companies is that they think, what could we offer as an IoT solution? But that's, honestly speaking, not the right approach. The right approach would be to think about what is the pain point of my customer and what is the value add we can provide. And with that um, um, idea, you really should consider that idea in, in the development of your IoT solution. And it, it sounds quite trivial, but it's really one of the key mistakes that companies don't come from the customer perspective. They come from their own perspective and start their IoT development uh, in the area which they think they know already. And that's also the reason why sometimes it's very difficult to, uh, to generate a value add with, with the solution. Um, so this is why you also always have to to uh, put the customer value first. It's very, very important. Um, on the technological side, of course, it's a quite uh, complex uh, area. There are still those topics, data security and data integrity, which are still not uh, solved. Of course, there are a lot of brownfield installations and you need to enable those brownfield installations if you really want to um, implement IoT adequately. Then you need to uh, integrate the different things, devices and sensors, or you need someone who is able to do that. Then of course, um, 
so most or some of the use cases they are um, combined with a very high volume of data in chest so this means there are high costs uh, which you have uh, um, to cover then there are currently no industry standards and that's uh, a very important point i would i want to highlight so um if you think about an entire production process um there are numerous assets and process in this production um, process involved and of course there are also numerous suppliers and if you are a plant operator you are usually interested in to get end-to-end -end transparency among the entire production process so we all have heard today several times about predictive maintenance but usually you get a predictive maintenance solution for a specific asset for a pump or a motor but if you want to get this um, to end transparency you need trans transparency among all assets so this means you need to combine different iot solutions and if there are no industry standards in the market it means that there is a huge customizing effort if you if you are able to to um, that you're able to share information across all those different uh, layers and applications and this is the reason why it's very important to in, to develop um, industry specific data models because uh, this is uh, the prerequisite to easily and effortless combined different solutions there are also currently some uh, some uh, initiatives which are trying to, to push that topic. For example, the new Namur um, collaboration. It's a uh, German-speaking interest collaboration for the chemicals industry. They are currently working on a on a um, standardized information model for the chemical industries. And there's also the Open Innovation Alliance. It's a group which is uh, which is, uh, how should I say, it's guided by SAP. And of course, SAP is also interested to develop um, industry standards and data models because that also helps them to easily uh, run and integrate their ERP systems. And maybe as a last talking point, um, sometimes, especially if we talk about that new infrastructure or connectivity infrastructure like 5G or LPWA, um, the, the infrastructure is still missing. So if you look into the European uh, uh, market, there are currently, there's currently no 5G network established and uh, connection providers, they're currently working on it. Okay. Yeah. So now what we have done, we have captured or I have given you a, a broad overview on, we have given you an overview on the business models. We have brought that into a context in the production area. Also, we have brought that in a context and uh, um, in a holistic area where we also involve suppliers, factories, uh, partners and assets. And we have uh, shown you the different players which are currently in the market we have talked about edge devices and we have talked about um, the technical and organizational challenges that the, the companies are currently facing and of course in our in our daily project work we we also have supported many many companies in the operation operation operationalization and commercialization of of iot use cases and we want to share some of the lessons learned with you, with you we have made. So you have already seen there are many, many different IoT use cases and really re recommend you to start with the initial selection of a few of them, five to six to seven different use cases, and then really to do, to do a, a screening of those um, use cases, which are the one which um, might be the most uh, um, interesting and attractive for your company. And what's also very important is to, to leverage the existing knowledge that you have. So for example, if you, if you develop an application, of course, it's important to understand your customer, your customer needs. And one of the, the key things really here is to always 
put the value proposition of the application on the first position. So it's really important if you think about the, the use case that you consider that triangle, the triangle of value proposition, value chain and profit mechanism. Because only when you're able to really um, offer your customer a value with that application, and if you're able also to do uh, to, uh, um, to do their technical realization, only then you're able to generate profit. It's it's a quite obvious slide, but please uh, keep in mind many, many companies do the mistake that they don't put the value proposition in advance or in, at the first position. It's, it's really one of the key points I wanted to, to share with you today. And um, a very, um, how should I say, a very good approach to ensure that you uh, consider that your IoT application has a value for the customer, that uh, business double development, uh, business model development approach I would like to share with you here. So it's, um, there are five steps. It starts with uh, the, the ideation phase of the, of the um, use case. You, so first of all, you, you should think about what are possible use cases then you should really think about the value proposition. So what are really um, the, the things which offer my customer a value? Then you, if you know the value you, you can provide your solution, then it's also much easier for you to develop a business. Because if you know that the customer, for example, can save 10,000 euro a year with that specific solution, then you are also, it's fine to, to offer or to ask uh, um, the <laughs> to to ask your customer for, for example, uh, three thousand euro um, benefit. Sorry, to to develop a business model which offers you three thousand uh, euro revenue. And then it's very important, um, or a recommendation from our side, to do the development application in a co-creation approach, in a joint approach together with your customer. So we, we really recommend you to, to do a first pilot in maybe six months. And in that pilot, you are developing, developing jointly with your customer the solutions, and you also give the possibility to, to adjust your, your solution to the customer needs. And then when you really have proven your pilot and you, you have proven that the pilot is a success, then um, you can think about uh, a global or you can think about uh, a, a production phase and about uh, scaling that, that solution. And um, across those five, sorry, across those five steps, um, um, there of course are many, many things to consider and to, to ensure that um, all relevant steps are covered in that uh, IoT solution development process. We have developed this Roland Berger IoT business model assessment. Um, so we, have, we have also divided um, this business model assessment into five main areas. So one is the business model. Secondly, the go-to-market approach. And then, of course, you also have to ensure in the production phase the architecture of your solution so that your IoT solution is able to easily be scaled and to be operated on various um, um, cloud infrastructures. Then you also have to ensure that the solution you have developed is adequately deployed. And you also have to consider, of course, the operations and, and service phase. It's, it's very important to understand that there is not only the, the ideation and the, the development of the use case, you also need to think about how you can operate your solution in the future. Okay, so I think, um, I think it would be now a good um, point to maybe to start the, the Q&A session. Bernard, what do you think? Yeah, let's go. I've seen there are already some questions, but I think the moderator will see us through the process here. 
yes, exactly. So thank you all for your presentation. Uh, so we have so far two questions. Uh, the first uh, uh, question comes from the commission. Uh, so uh, if for IIoT, uh, one of the main challenges are related to missing standards and data models, it will prevent reaping the full benefit of IoT. But what does this mean to exploit advances in AI? So who would uh, reply to this? Okay, I, I, so if, if you talk about AI or machine learning, it's of course based on data. So you need, you need standardized data to get the full or to leverage the full potential of AI and machine learning. Because especially when you talk about machine learning, it's very important that the data has always the same structure. There had always be to, to, to the same structure of data. There has to be the same format of data. And it's very important, especially if you think about a different, um, if you think about the entire production process with different assets and you want to train a model which helps you to, uh, to improve the entire production process, it's important that every data it independently from which supplier or which kind of asset or if pump, valve, motor or so on, um, has the same data structure because that's the only way to really efficiently train your data model. So that's that's one of the main reasons why it's very important to develop um, those standardized data models. And I think it's, it would be also a very interesting topic for Sesimo to drive that topic maybe in, in some areas. Thank you for your reply. Uh, the second question, uh, so the second question is um, regarding the past topic, Siemens and MySphere uh, position itself as an open platform supported by a community of machine manufacturers and other actors with the international association, uh, MySphere World. What is your assessment of the usefulness of an open ecosystem like this to create reference standards and architectures? It's absolutely essential to to do that because um, you can only only establish industrial standards if you have a huge community and a huge group with, with the same interests. And that's very that's the reason why it's very useful to establish an, an organization, for example, like the Mindsphere World, because it's a group of, uh, for example, machinery producer, which also have the same interest. And I think it's really here a good example how a group can start the development of such industry-specific standards. Thank you. Uh, do we have more questions? Because uh, we already uh, we just uh, had these two questions uh, in the chat. So if you have any other questions, please uh, now it's time to to ask your questions. Feel free to to ask whenever you want uh, regarding the, the topic. So if there is no questions, uh, I would like to, to ask one question. So uh, uh, which are the, the opportunities for SMEs considering uh, their smaller size and uh, lower budget compared to, to big companies? So maybe maybe I give, give an answer and please, of course, Alexander, add to this. Um, I think it's not such a question whether you are a small or a big one. You know, we see in this business many, many different opportunities. We even see startups, you know, they have a budget of maybe 50K. Even startups can, of course, enter this business. So it does not really depend on the, on the size. Um, but of course, I think it's interesting to understand what are you addressing and where are you playing? So if you just want to, to provide one single feature, like, for example, overall equipment efficiency measurement, uh, that's something you can easily do. Of course, if you want to address wider areas, then, of course, at a certain point in time, it's useful for you, of course, to invest to become maybe even an own platform. And, of course, of being a platform is the next big step. And we've seen 
some of the companies, you know, we know Trump, we know Adamos, of course, they have done the big step in, in providing a platform. That, of course, is something either you are a very big startup with a big funding um, or you are an established player. So I think there are opportunities on each level depending on the feature you want to offer and, of course, the money you can invest. Yeah. Thank you. It, it, it's uh, also a huge, and in my opinion, also a huge um, opportunity because, for example, if this SME has a nice IoT solution, they really can use um, the ecosystem, the partner network to really scale that that solution. So maybe they are, they, with that new IoT technology and the new IoT marketplaces, they are really able to sell products based on this IoT platforms without um, really uh, the need to uh, to um, pro the sales organization. If they do it clever, they really can re leverage the, the advantages of these IoT platforms and IoT marketplaces. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, in the meantime, we received another question. So could you expand uh, on the role of industrial connectivity for edge IoT solutions? In your opinion, which are the main drivers, stakeholders to drive next generation of IoT connectivity? In my opinion, these are exactly those two groups we already have shown here. So probably the, the group with the highest interest are the classical automation provider it's because an uh, edge device um, is really a, a huge threat for the class because an edge device is uh, quite comparable to a, class, a classical industrial automation product like a distributed control system or an industrial PC or process control system. It has more or less the same capabilities. And then of course, uh, IT hardware market, they are interested to sell their products. Maybe one more thing to add to this is, of course, at the end, IoT depends on the infrastructure. So do we have connectivity? And yes, we have connectivity, but of course, the connectivity is not really cheap. So we have seen companies like, for example, Zigfox coming in with a, with a very cheap technology that works globally. We, of course, see that with 5G, there will be solutions for IoT devices. Of course, let's assume you just have a, a pump, a water pump to order to, in order to control an open pit mine, and you have 500 pumps around this open pit mine, and you want to get each of them into the, into the internet. It, it makes a difference whether you pay whatever, 200 euros a year for connectivity, or you pay two euros. And of course, in the future with 5G and new business models, we will be able to use, of course, a cheaper infrastructure that then, of course, on top will drive these use cases. Thank you. So, uh, linked to the previous question, uh, again, the, uh, the question from the Commission. So, it's not clear uh, the role of uh, mobile suppliers like uh, Huawei or 5G. I think it's twofold. The one thing is, of course, yes, they are technology providers to 5G. That's the one thing. And of course, the other thing is, I know that some of these companies, of course, are working even on hardware on ships. You know, how can how can devices be linked easily into their network? So, I think the primary role, of course, is to create this infrastructure as fast as possible, possible, which is more or less a kind of public role. And then, of course, the second one is, of course, to provide hardware to ensure connectivity as cheap as possible. And also Huawei, for example, would be an edge device uh, supplier. They also develop edge devices and you could group them exactly in that group of IT hardware network suppliers. Thank you. Uh, no more questions from the audience, uh, as I can see. Uh, so with this, I would like to uh, close uh, today's event. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. It was a really interesting uh, uh, discussion. Uh, as I said uh, already, um, the, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel uh, and we will share with you uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so 
that would be it uh, from my side. Once again, uh, thank you all for your participation. And uh, that would be it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure being with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.